okay good morning everyone uh it's so nice to see all of you early morning 6:30 in cold wind uh, uh in at least in north part of india uh today we are starting a new uh, dimension that we always think that uh, they may not need but most of the time that's why we ignore it so we are starting pediatric palliative care today and when pediatric palliative care comes in india i think gayatri uh, is number 1 so dr gayatri pollard is basically a very good friend of mine excellent friend of indian palliative care community whenever there is a develop any development which we will plan in india for in terms of palliative care i think gayatri is always in the forefront and always with all her positivity and positive comments i think she is really helping in the development of palliative care in india since last three decades uh, basically uh, everybody knows that gayatri is based in hyderabad and looking after the as a pain and palliative care medicine department as a consultant in mnj institute of oncology a very famous institute of oncology and gayatri uh, is also very important holding a very important post as a director of pax south asia two worlds cancer collaboration in canada so basically you must have seen lot of programs are going on with this organization and gayatri is basically is leading the uh, from forefront in india from india uh, she is also founder member of pain relief and palliative care society hyderabad and with two important courses she is directing that as a director is post doctoral fellowship in palliative medicine recently uh, we advertised this post in various platforms including iapc uh, newsletter so she is looking after as a director of this course as well as post doctoral fellowship in pediatric palliative care which we re recently finished and our residents really enjoyed this course uh, uh, through eco platform so gayatri uh i think no one can uh, better be better than you as when the pediatric palliative care comes so we are looking forward to hear you i think i think we can have to we have to mute our mic everyone should mute your their mic very good morning to all of you and thank you so much uh, sushma for the introduction and um yeah i also see many other senior faculty here so it's more of sharing and learning from each other and um, i'm very glad that we are doing one blocks um, sessions on pediatric palliative care just so just showing that how how much importance we are giving to this population very special population which we see in your practice many of us are i'm not a pediatrician i'm an anesthesiologist by profession not professional like by training and but i see many uh, pediatricians joining in this group but we also have a lot of other specialties doing palliative care and sometimes we don't have a choice we see children so my session would be a very broad outlook as to how to help children who are coming to you in pain so i'll just start with a uh, screen sharing oh, apni so when arun wrote to me he asked me to uh, talk about uh, three important goal while trying to um, cover this session uh, assessing pain in children how to assess pain when you children present to you in pain analgesic prescription and some non pharmacological approach for managing pain and um, so when i do this presentation most of it i have taken it from it a lot of experience but also a lot of evidence but uh, just to let you know that um, recently we finished developing a guideline for chronic pain management by the world health organization and i was part of the core group looking at the as a guideline uh, management committee uh, looking at the evidence and uh, based on that uh, based on which we developed this guideline but just to say that as expected obviously because of the in inherent issues which we see in children we don't have many really good evidence to look at various aspects of managing pain in children very little evidence we found and but still we came out with some general consensus 
So what I'm sharing is based on available evidence which we have related to pediatric palliative care. Um, sorry. I'm not able to move. Yeah. So like many childhood diseases, the initial presentation is pain. And if you look at ICD-11 classification, this is the general chronic pain classification, and it applies even to pediatric. So chronic pain, for uh, based on ICD, they divided into chronic primary pain and chronic secondary pain. Primary pain, as we see in children, it very commonly we see with chronic primary abdominal pain or musculoskeletal pain, <laughs> headaches. These are all primary pain when we, do, uh, we don't have, we can pinpoint the etiology and various, various secondary causes of pain because of trauma or uh, various neuropathic pain secondary to many conditions, cancer pain, these are all secondary pain. So this is how they classified uh, based, on, based on ICD. Um, we see pain in children, a near daily pain, as a classic example is juvenile arthritis, migraine, inflammatory bowel disease, cystic, cystic fibrosis. Whereas in developing country, we have very unique issues related to very endemic conditions like malaria, HIV AIDS, sickle cell disease, and similar conditions. I have some lag in moving the slides, sorry. Um, Vinila, do you mind presenting the slide from your side? I'm ready, ma'am. I'll do it. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Otherwise, I'll be wasting a lot of time. Can you, can you stop your screen share once? Yeah. Thank you, Vinila. Yeah, next slide. Examples of neuropathic pain in children, like we take the classic we see in spinal cord injury, autoimmune diseases or degenerative conditions, of course, cancer, very common in HIV AIDS. And in children, sometimes we see these very toxic uh, metabolic neuropathies like lead and mercury poisoning. Next slide. And this is one very special group which we see so commonly in children is severe neurological impairment. If you look at the recent uh, ATLAS and look at the common conditions where we need palliative care, you must have seen that ATLAS and those pictures very um, repeatedly, you must have seen that. And if you look at the profile of children requiring palliative care, a big chunk is about children born with metabolic or genetic conditions or born with um, uh, perinatal uh, issues. Um, and all of them, they, they are left with severe neurological impairment. And if you look at them, what almost 40% of them, they, are, they have severe pain. And they have pain, and if your pain is very severe, it's like. And of course, most of us, we are working with cancer, and we know that how common cancer pain is. But in the interesting aspect of cancer pain is that we see the pain because of progressive disease, but more common we see because of invasive conditions. Most common cancer in children is leukemia, lymphoma. And when you treat, do treatment for these children, it's all very invasive. It's all about giving chemotherapy. And chemotherapy means giving port, having a port or peripheral lines or intrathecal and repeated investigations before and after black, black, uh, black picture and then bone marrow. All these are very painful procedures. So we see a lot of procedural pain when you're dealing with children with cancer. Next slide. Now look at this child. This is a typical classic cancer pain uh, presentation. Pradeep, name changed, 10 years, 10 years, uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, induction, undergoing treatment. The child complains of pain, severe pain, pain in the back and the leg. Why do you think this child is having pain? Yes, probably, next slide, the, probably the child is having 
bone pain because of leukemia you know that bone marrow gets um, filled cho choco blocked and filled up and you get bone pain very common one history we always ask when these children pre present like that did you undergo any um, investigation or any procedure in your back often they would have undergone bone marrow or intrathecal and the pain be remains there and they complain of severe pain often these procedures may lead to abscess hematoma or um, any uh, trauma there and that can itself cause pain and of course the neuropathic pain because a lot of lymph nodes will be there intra abdominal and that can cause plexopathy and pain so if you look at it it's a combination of many uh, many aspects just looking at the physical part of it i'm not talking about psychosocial dimension of pain that of course plays a very important role in the overall picture of pain next slide when you ask a child what is the one thing which you hate about coming to the hospital they would tell you it's injections they that is the most traumatic and painful event experienced by children by when they undergo treatment in the hospital next slide and the pain can be as i described finger finger prick when you puncture vac vaccination you don't think about it not in cancer in general children vaccination pain we think okay just give the vaccine what's a big deal about it give it and just then with it but that can later on it has a lot of implication the vaccination pain lumbar puncture bone marrow aspiration next slide another example a 5 year old with cerebral palsy when you look at profile of children outside cancer i think the one common condition which is the most common i think lulu madam would also agree is Ch ch children with cerebral palsy, which we see in palliative care. Here, example of a child with spastic quadriplegia, mostly bed bound, non-verbal seizures, also has bulbar pal palsy requ requiring ease on gastrostomy feed, and this excess secretion, which is leading to repeated aspiration and hospitalization. Why do you think this child has pain? Do you think this child can have pain? Next slide. If you look at this picture, this is what they they talk about: a hidden pain in children with neurological impairment. If you look at top to bottom, there's multiple reason that why this child would have pain, starting from headaches, dental caries, gingivitis, otitis, cord separation, because they they don't have they and they can't even describe what's happening to them. And of course, we expect that this uh, this child would have a lot of muscle spasm contractures joint pain very common we see gastrointestinal grd we say and that itself can lead to a lot of pain in these children because often they have feeding issues constipation food intolerance gallstones urinary tract infection quite common and of course bed sore if you look at it from top to bottom various reasons the why a child with cerebral palsy would have pain normally we don't, we don't think about pain in cerebral palsy but yes it can happen in these kind of children next slide and i'm just trying to give an example outside the purview of uh, cancer like how ch the child presents and what kind of pain would you expect a 2 month 22 month old baby refer to you for episodic body arching and screaming the child just simply goes into screaming and goes back and um, um, uh, arch of body and if this episode occurs daily in clusters lasting for 5 to 10 20 minutes at a time with little relief in between is not slept for weeks next slide and uh, the medical history shows that he the child has severe neonatal hypoxic ischemic, uh, ischemic encephalopathy cortical visual impairment seizures and gastrointestinal esophageal reflux this is again a very classic presentation next slide if you look at this child this child this the pro probable causes of pain could be because of central neuropathic pain visceral hyperalgesia autonomic dysfunction dystonia autonomic irritability in combination with dystonia spasticity muscle spasm delirium now i put delirium here because we very often we cannot differentiate distress from pain in these kind of children often it's a combination so it just can just be distress and irritability and they just manifest as um, irritable or distressed child i'm not going to detail of this because i'm hoping that you would have covered all this in some aspects of better physiology of pain even when discussing adult next slide 
So why are we discussing pain here today? What is the consequences? The more and more the, the, the studies have done and there is very clear understanding that next, uh, that pain, chronic pain or pain experience in childhood has a very, uh, carries the consequence to adulthood when they grow to become an adult, they ca carry the risk of chronic pain behavior as they become older. And a lot of post-traumatic stress disorder responses. Classic we see after cancer treatment, the child survives. And as a survivor, they describe the experience which still comes as a nightmares to them and often carries a lot of psychological morbidity. Next slide. And if, of course, it has a very direct um, functional disability, a functional and physical disability like sleep disturbances, absence from school, reduction in physical activity, poor peer group interaction and social development, which is so crucial for a child as they grow, emotional dysfunction, anxiety, low mood depression and the economic implication. So when we're looking at the guidelines, as I said, it's a WHO guideline. There were very interesting studies about the economic implication of having a child with chronic pain and the family, what they suffer because of this um, issue in the family. Next slide. Despite this recognition, inadequate prevention and relief of children's pain is still widespread. A lot of um, um, in, uh, reluctance on behalf of pediatricians or even a palliative care people or anybody who's dealing with child to understand and address this pain issue. Next slide. So coming to the next component, how do we assess pain? Next slide. So most uh, the way we assess pain is a child self-report, which is the gold standard, they say. But we all often, we depend on parental report. But in a very smaller child or child who, who are with a serious neurological impairment, we look at the observational methods. Next slide. And as I said, self-report is a gold standard, even for a child, self-report. Next slide. They say a child as small as two year old, they can report pain. They, if you ask them, very often we, rem we don't remember to ask the child directly. We often ask the parent and then it's a very indirect reporting and we don't, we miss a lot of things. So as a, um, all the postgraduate students, I would recommend that when you see a child, try to ask the child directly, do you have pain? Where is your pain? And the, all the questions related to pain. Next slide. Of course, a older child, if they know, if you explain to them, what do you mean by zero and 10 and worst pain imaginable, if you explain to them, they are much, some, I feel that they're much better than adult in describing pain. They describe it beautifully. And once they know, next time before they see you, they'll tell you, hey, today I've got five out of 10 pain. So this is how they, uh, and they, they do it well. Next slide. And there are other methods of pain, uh, uh, scoring pain. And this is very popular in many centers who are dealing with pediatric pain. They look at this FACES pain scale, which is a revised scale I put here. And uh, this is very typically we use for four to eight, even older children when they don't understand numerical scale, but this, they should know how to ask. Next slide. So this is how we ask. These faces show how much something can hurt. This face pointing towards the left shows no pain. And the faces as you move to, from here to the, the right, it shows more and more pain. And up to this one where it's maximum pain, so much pain. Point to the face that shows how much you hurt today, right now. So this is how we ask the child. So you should know how to ask. This is how uh, this is described. Next slide. Of course, a child describes very well when you have this relative uh, um, scoring in terms of uh, like poker chips in three to six year old, they understand quantity. So the, this is another way you can score pain. Next slide. Very commonly uh, or simply, if they, they are totally confused, they just don't know what to do. We'll ask them, do you have pain? This much pain, this much pain, this much pain. So just showing with fingers and we get a fair idea about the, the severity of pain. Next slide. And of course, in our culture, even a small child understands uh, uh, rupee coins and we can always uh, give, show them coins and ask them about pain. Next slide. A lot of newer technologies mostly we use in research. They have the electronic version of pain and they, they are very good with children these days with these electronic uh, things and they do fairly well if you really want to capture pain electronically. 
next slide limitation of just scoring pain is that how they describe it's like music in terms of loudness just but it hides many complex issues when you just score pain it's low music dull music or high volume music it doesn't capture other nuances of music when you listen to music it's just like that scoring pain that's why they they give the importance of going much more into the complexity or understanding the complexity next slide so we typically even in the child we ask this question pqrst you are all aware of that and in addition next slide we also look at um, other aspect what have you tried to relieve pain has it worked and asking of course the parents of the child is small and how is it affecting your life how are you playing are you eating food are you sleeping how is your mood uh, activity of daily living a most child it's very this side all or none i always feel a child if there is in pain they won't leave the mother's lap they curled up and they refuse to even to get down on the uh, on, on the floor and they just curled up but the moment you give them pain relief they just ready to play they just start we know by looking at the child okay yes we have achieved pain relief it's also they are not like adult they go on brooding it's very drastic uh, the response of is my observation next slide there are problems with when you try to score pain using um, uh, scales especially in a smaller child what you need to understand is that they may not understand this relativity um, z like um, zero to 10 so the anchoring so normally when you use anchor we use okay 1 kilo 5 kilo 10 kilo that that may not they may not get have that sense get developed to understand this anchors so they may not really understand so we really need to make them understand next slide what do you mean by relate relativity so you have to give many more uh, 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 smaller division not 1 kilo and 100 kilos 1 kilo 10 kilo 50 like that so that they they get the sense of what we are talking about very good reason that they may not tell you about pain because of other social any social um background issues i don't want a needle if i say yes you will hurt me more i want to be good i want to be good boy so they may not tell you pain i want to go home if i tell you pain and you may admit me and i don't want to worry my parents so there are other reasons social uh, um influences which may influence the way a child may report pain next slide so observation these are all a child himself telling you as a self report but many a child may not be able to, in that condition to ex express to you uh, the way we would like to so in that situation we use scales other scales as observational scales next slide but this is very classic we see in infants smaller babies a child who is in distress again I, here we cannot differentiate pain and distress we just look at the distress that classic child in distress this is how they would look like like blob bulge eye squeeze nasal level deepened furrow open lips this furrow will be very deepened open lips or sometimes vertical mouth lips pursed taut tongue if you look at this taut tongue chin quivering and tongue protrusion so this is how we make sense of distress well now for a pediatrician this may be very okay they know all already for us maybe it's it's uh, worth knowing that this uh, how to recognize distress in a uh, infant i have i see lulu madam here if madam if you have comments please chip in or you know, maybe if you can just tell uh, tell us more about it later um yeah next slide of course in um, a neonatal in infant pain scale we use this is a very uh, cl classic observational very standardized uh, scale which we use um for ba smaller babies next slide and uh, and uh, any baby big 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 children also when they can't express or neurological they have neurological conditions we use flac r which is a revised scale it's just like apgar score i feel like it but uh, it's just uh, we look at the face legs activity cry consolability now this needs little training especially when you're, you're involving your staff nurses you should know what to look for how to recognize this how to score you need a bit little bit of Tra training as to what it means when you say legs. What is the normal position? What is one grade one and a uh, two? A uh, score two. How does it look like? Similarly, face. So it's important that the team is 
trained in um, recognizing this and scoring. Next slide. Like I said, next slide. The 2020 guideline, which is going to come, uh, come soon, they could not find much evidence, especially you'll be surprised that there aren't any evidence about pharmacological management of pain, especially with regard to palliative care. There are some uh, pain, chronic pain conditions like headaches, irritable bowel condition, functional pain. They have some ph ph uh, pharmacological uh, uh, evidence. Nothing whatsoever about opioids, actually. When I say evidence, I mean to say randomized control trial. There were much more evidence around psychosocial, uh, sorry, physical, psychological and uh, physical therapy uh, uh, kind of um, uh, interventions. They had more evidence. But generally, the consensus which they came up with was that a child with chronic pain should be seen as a biopsychosocial and multimodal model approach that should be dealt with this kind of approach when trying to manage pain. Next slide. So it should be very well integrated uh, when we're looking at the management of pain, both pharmacological and non-pharmacological. Next slide. When you talk about pharmacological here, I'm today I'm going to talk just about a little more grown up child. I'm not looking at neonatal pain because there you need to understand a little more in, in depth about the pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics and neuroanatomical organization. So I'm not covering that in this today's session. So we are looking at little grown or, or grown up little babies as maybe after six months. They will say by six months, their liver, kidneys are mature enough to metabolize, excrete, and also um, the protein in the blood level, uh, the way it, the binding happens, and the neuroanatomical organization has little mature by six months. So after that is generally more or less the same when we look at what we are going to describe now. Next slide. It's so the same principle which we follow for adult, but all the more, the first point, giving the medication by the mouth is more important here because that's the most effective, least painful and simplest. And one thing here I would like to highlight is, next slide, the mother or the families, uh, sorry, can we go back? The family should be taught about the use of SOS medication very uh, properly. We'll come to that more uh, once again, but this is the same principle. Next slide. This is the two-step analgesic ladder we talk about. In adult, we have three-step analgesic ladder when we manage cancer pain. Here we talk about two-step analgesic ladder. Why only two-step? Why, why not tramadol? Next slide. The reason, um, the recommendation, they have taken away the step two of the ladder. What they found is there is a lot of inter-ethical and inter-individual variability how a codeine or tramadol is metabolized in the body. And that has led to a lot of safety and efficacy issues in children. And we cannot, and we cannot take this children because either they get over sedated or it can lead to more serious issues. So they said it should not be used. That's the general consensus. In fact, next slide, FDA has gone on to say that children younger than 12 years should not take tramadol or codeine, which pose a serious risk for slowed or difficult breathing and death. I know that in India, very commonly we use tramadol a lot in children. Acute pain, there are some evidence. I'm talking about chronic persistent pain, but in uh, children, it's not recommended. So we have to decide what should be our take on this. Next slide. I'm not going into detail of the dosing. It, I, am share, I, I think this will be shared and there are some other resources which I already shared with um, Dr. Arun where we can look at the dosing very nicely described. This is the common uh, NSAIDs which we use for children and paracetamol is the safest. Use paracetamol, safe for kidney, so safe for your GI tract, baby's GI tract and various formulations are available. Good thing about it is that we have syrups and so you can use orally or rectally or, in, uh, or if required very rarely intravenously. They also talk about some evidence about uh, selective COX-2 inhibitors like etoric oxib. I use sometimes etoric oxib, especially when, we, when you see a child with leukemia bleeding into the joints, a lot of inflammation. Your opioids may not be fully responsive. They get drowsy if you increase opioids, but they have severe pain in the joints and they're curled up. So when you use etoric oxib for a few days, because it's supposed to be a little more safer 
in terms of platelet, actual it's platelet and GI tract. So you can, uh, there are evidence about use of uh, selective COX-2 inhibitor in this kind of situation. For a few days, we use we under control conditions. Next slide. Other than can, you use, we all know we use opioids in cancer. There are a lot of concerns about, especially in the Western world, about use of opioids in non-cancer conditions. But there are some clear guidelines about use of opioids in non-cancer conditions. But you of course, you should be very cautious. But classic we use in sickle cell crisis right, uh, and other vascular conditions. S serious neurological impairment, burns, cystic fibrosis, epidermolysis, bullosa, very painful condition which we see, skin condition, where it, if the child comes with overall or all over the body, lesions, and very painful. So these are the very classic examples of where we use opioids outside the cancer um, hospital uh, in non-cancer conditions. Next slide. Again, just like adult, morphine remains a drug of choice for pain in children when we talk about opioids. I'm using this as a step two, because remember, we step two, we are not describing, so our step three becomes step two here. Next slide. And if you look at the WHO uh, model list of essential medicines for children, they have all formulations of opioids. We don't have all these formulations. We just have in India, mostly injections and tablets. And we, we tried, we are still waiting the day where we, where we will get syrup morphine. And Sushma, that's something I think we should think about in this uh, tenure. How do we procure, um, how do we influence a pharmaceutical company to provide us with syrup morphine? Which will, will be helpful even for adult in special situations. So, but this is described in WHO model list of essential medicines. Next slide. Again, just like adult, we use, even in children, we are not talking of new nets, but in an um, ch older child, Use morphine four hourly. There's nothing like, oh, this is a child, so I should not be using four hourly. Use four hourly. Dose titration, just like adult. Again, the child's need depends on, uh, the morphine need depends on child's pain. So you increase, keep increasing till you get the pain and end result as pain relief or a child showing undesirable side effects. Next slide. And like I said here, the instruction should be about rescue dose because the child depends on the mother or the family to get that rescue dose. So the family should be really influenced to um, give that rescue dose liberally. And so they need to understand that. So the team should be um, making, making that extra effort to train the family members to give rescue dose to the child. Next slide. Again, I'm not going into the dosing that's available. So we have very clearly defined dosings for uh, oral, injections, subcutaneous, or infusions. Next slide. Fentanyl patch. Yes, it, there are studies about effective, safe use of uh, well-tolerated use of uh, transdermal patches, especially never a first line. I, we never use it as a first line most of the situation. Um, uh, yes, I see um, Arun's request to put uh, comments or discussions in the chat. Please uh, do it. Uh, thank you, Arun. Uh, the specific indications where we use fentanyl patch is for swallowing disturbances when they can't take orally or we have compliance issues. A child refused to take tablets orally, so we put them on fentanyl patch. Again, dosing is described. Next slide. Injection fentanyl is typically we reserve for very special conditions like infants, babies with renal insufficiency, or in palliative sedation kind of situation, we use in injection fentanyl in pediatrics. Next slide. Even though less evidence, very little evidence, but it's found to be safe in children. Typically, we use methadone in opioid rotation and complex neuropathic pain condition. Just like adult, we require to use this. Even children, we face these um, problems like um, opioid tolerance, hyperalgesia. We use this to rotate opioids or when we see very complex you know, neuropathic pain condition. Next slide. But understanding that there are issues um, around methadone, we're using methadone. They have very long half-life, half as it is, they describe in children, very long half-life. 
So there's a risk of delayed sedation. You start today and after five days, child will be drowsy. So if you don't have a proper supervision, don't use it. And of course, we have issues with QT prolongation and drug interaction. It's adding to the problem. And so we should be very really cautious. The, uh, the message I would like to give here for methadone, next slide, and is that you need special training, proper training. Um, uh, Joyta, there's a question. I will come back to Joyta's question. Very important question. Yeah. So we need training, and unless we uh, there's a provision uh, for proper assessment supervision, don't use methadone. Even in home care, we use it provided your home care team is constantly monitoring the child. Next slide. The side effect profile is same like adults. I'm not describing going to detail. Even child a child gets constipated. Remember that even they need laxatives. So don't stop laxatives, don't withhold laxatives. You must prescribe laxatives routinely. Next slide. Uh, even they, they have all these issues, so we should be aware of that. Next slide. Addiction. Often the family is so concerned about addiction in, in children. Yes, we should be mindful of that. Family is concerned. I also, this is very connected to what Joyta asked just now about family understanding and training. But when you use for palliative care conditions, they, they say that appropriate medical use of prescribed pain medications, such as opioids, when properly monitored, does not lead to addiction in young children and adolescents. But it all is all about how closely you monitor and you prescribe and in what conditions. The consensus is that outside palliative care just be wary of using opioids in children. Um, so uh, so you, the, this, is, uh, uh, this is the recommendation. Next slide. And uh, American Academy of Pediatrics, the, the general recommendation they talk about when you're prescribing opioids in children, they say multi-pronged approach. The prescriber and family education, again, coming back to Joyta's question. The prescriber, all of us, we should be very well trained and the family should be educated when you're using opioids in children. A communication of expectation, what is that you're expecting when you're using opioids? Assessment of risk of misuse, especially these days, even adolescents. I see in Hyderabad, a lot of adolescent kids, they try out many things. So we should be always assessing the risk of misuse. And of course, the universal monitoring, universal mo monitoring about use of opioids. Uh, uh, I see so use of, ketamine. we'll come to ketamine. Uh, so use of opi uh, universal monitoring, like number of pills described, tracking, single source of prescription, coming for refill should be single source, pill counting. And these are the some universal monitoring which we use for any, any patient, but more in children, we should be very careful. Next slide. We know that all pain cannot be treated with morphine. Next slide. So we have this adjuvant medications, which we talk about. These are the dosage we specifically mentioned in pediatrics. But I don't know about gabapentinoids because gabapentinoids are used so commonly in children for various neurological conditions, even for pain conditions. Everywhere they talk about gabapentinoids, but FDA has given a very strong um, um, Warning, and even the WH has come out with a very strong statement about the use of gabapentinoids and how they are recommending more and more not to use it. And so we have to really debate around that now. If we don't have gabapentinoids, what is an alternative? And this very poor evidence against TCAs also, but that's another safe alternative because it's relatively well studied. Next slide. So this is very interesting ladder which I found in, in this one. This is this paper, which uh, uh, pain assessment and treatment in children with significant impairment of central nervous system came out. Uh, this is given, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics they brought out this article. They talk about again, again if you see here they talk about gabapentinoid, and as a second, this is the ladder they talk about. Next slide. Non-pharmacological approach. Next slide. Uh, coming back to this child, remember that I told you about this child, two month, 22 month old with HIE, um, episodic uh, uh, arching and screaming, episodes of screaming. And we know that he has various issues. 
but the other things other than medications which would which can help this child is rocking massage repositioning fan cool air music water support equipments like seating the how you seat the child pillows calm environment sleep and avoid gastrointestinal distension like overfeeding constipation so these are all it may sound very simple but makes a lot of difference to a ch irritable child so trying trying out this thing should be an essential element of our managing pain uh, in a child like uh, like this baby next slide there's a lot of articles lot of uh, papers coming out in this aspect psychological therapy very focused therapy around pain management especially we, when we talk about functional abdominal pain irritable bowel syndrome migraine all this uh, other non cancer conditions lot of significance of this um, managing this kind of uh, intervention trying to use this intervention in uh, children we use this one thing which we use we even in cancer i use a lot both informal and formal play therapy so these are the uh, different aspects they uh, um, talk about they talk about um, next slide of course th as i said this is one other area where a lot of studies have uh, they are bringing out physical therapy especially when children with uh, spasticity uh, cerebral palsy this plays a very important role simple techniques they talk about again this is not a scope uh, scope of discussion here today i just projected to show you like simple techniques like this can help a child when a child with cerebral palsy they often have tiptoe so when you just make them sit on the chair and just strap them while they eating so they can eat themselves in instead of otherwise what the family tend to do just make them lie down on the bed and feed them in the mouth and that leads to a lot of other complications like aspiration so these are all physical therapy and rehabilitation measures which can help a child in pain or spasticity spasticity or contractures next slide if you slides about um procedural pain as i said one of the most traumatic experience it is described by every child who are, who have been to the hospital next slide so again here they talk about a child centric approach when you managing a procedural pain often when the child when we need to do intrathecal what we do we just pin down the child and then just to uh, ask one of the most uh, hefty uh, uh, the ward boy there and our success of our procedure is like how well we position the child so our whole focus is how to pin down the child properly so that i get that position to do my intrathecal but often this can lead to lot of distress and trauma to the child who is undergoing the procedure and to the family very often they drop out from treatment just for this one reason that they just can't bear to see the child suffering and the child refused to come to the hospital so in order to make this proced procedural pain much more easy for them involve the child and the family as active participants next slide so tell them what is happening before doing the procedure accurate information often they prepare they better they are better uh, better prepared to face that procedure and it takes away a lot of their fears improves improves compliance and this needs should be explained in a language they understand like simple things like i i'm going to give you a medicine in your bag because it will help you to get better we don't do that we just simply make the position the child simply poke the needle and run with it and often that leads to other questions other problems so this is what important element when you talk about procedural pain again don't jump to what medication i'm going to give rather start with this approach and it help, goes a long way in helping a child undergoing the procedure next slide smaller babies non nutritive nutritive sucking there are lot of studies which have come out uh, come uh, come around this uh, this aspect of intervention a uh, pediatrician uh, normally they would know this but for us to understand this plays a very important role in smaller babies when you're doing any procedure uh, using this approach next slide of course emla cream all of you must be familiar so we use a lot of emla cream in our practice both for mostly for intrathecal and bone marrow it really helps a child to anesthetize the skin but you must be giving the success of this intervention would be how much time you give before the procedure to do this it needs at least 45 minutes to 60 minutes prior to the procedure for this application 
and there should be good occlusive dressing when you are applying MLA cream. Next slide. And for conscious sedation, we use oral midazolam for a very small child, screaming child, anxious child. We use oral midazolam as a con first conscious sedation. And again, at least it should be given 30 minutes prior to the procedure. Next slide. And this is one study which we did in our center, and it, it, we also published it. Uh, this is uh, low dose ketamine for or orally, prior 30 minutes prior to the procedure. We found that a significant reduction in self-reported pain when used low dose ketamine orally for procedural pain. Next slide. These are simple things which a pediatrician for them it comes naturally for but us to remember. Swaddling the child is very helpful for babies. They feel very secure. Next slide. And this is very important, the kangaroo care and the breast feeding prior to the procedure. It just takes five minutes, but do it. And then uh, while doing the procedure. Next minute, next slide. And it's all about positioning, comfort, distraction. How you position the child, how comfortable you make the child and distraction, simple distractions like blowing bubbles. Beautiful way to distract. Just blow bubbles and they're distracted or telling them stories or doing things like that. Next slide. When you say giving control, ask the child, how would you like to be when we're doing this procedure? Would you like to watch or would you like to look away? Would you like to sit up in the chair by yourself or you want to sit on your mother's lap? Would you, which arm would you like to uh, for taking blood pressure? Like that, give the control to the child. Next slide. And it's good if you have this kind of displays uh, displayed where the nurses are doing the procedure so that they remember what is the best position for a child when they're doing the procedure. Next slide. Finally, to conclude, painful procedures, high pain prevalence and emotional trauma of facing a potentially life-threatening illnesses cause enormous suffering to children and their parents. Biopsychosocial model approach to pain management is recommended. Next slide. Two-step approach, an effective strategy for the management of cancer pain in children. Next. And finally, oral morphine is still the gold standard for managing pain in children. I stop here and I take questions because I was, I was planning to play a video, but there are a lot of questions. So I'll stop here and we'll just take, discuss uh, the questions raised in the chat. So Arun, go ahead with the questions. Yeah, thank you. We have excellent uh, presentations, Gayatri. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Thank you for the nice presentation. We have a lot of uh, we have some time for questions. So first question from Dr. Devadar. Uh, are there studies on parents' perception of morphine use in children? Are there any cross-cultural differences? So I'm aware of one uh, the studies. Um, in fact, a good uh, randomized control trial about use of opioids and parents' concern. I don't really have the paper here with me, but they, uh, there, there were concerns. Um, um, there, there are studies around that in the Western context, again. So I don't know the Indian context, we have not done it. And- What is your uh, experience on this? I mean, when you talk to parents, what do they say? Sorry? When you talk to parents, what is your experience when you talk to parents in so, our country? Immediate response is no. They want to delay. Um, for poor, uh, illiterate families, when you tell them I'm going to start this medicine, um, not like I, I should not be saying that, but they, often they are much more uh, accepting, accepting because they don't really understand the, um, they don't read about it. But for any I've seen, I'm telling you all the non-cancer pain conditions which I see, or even cancer pain conditions. We had a child with a very severe pain, cancer pain condition. The family delayed the use of opioid till the last and child suffered. Finally, child received opioid and we felt very bad. So they, really, I even in our, I see it more in our context that they have a lot of reservations around use of opioids. I want to hear from others. Okay, we'll uh, come back to others. Thank you for that uh, insight. Uh, next question is that, uh, does chronic use of opioids affect mental development in growing functions in a child? Um, it all, again, when we are using opioids, 
Number one, often this is a common lay concern. Of course, your question is concerned to very specific issue. But the common lay concern is that when you use opioids, you drug the child and you make the child um, totally not uh, useful to the society, which is not. We, we always titrate the dose such that they are functional, they're going to school and they carry on with the play and other activities. But having said that, I'm not sure about the actual any, any um, ph pharmacological effect on the brain directly. I would like to hear from Shloba. But of course, there are studies around effect on gonads and it may affect their physical growth. I'm not very sure about that. Um, Shoba, do you have any uh, response to that or others? Um, uh, Gayatri, hi. Um, so uh, for children for you know, many years with non-cancer pain, um, we don't have, actually, we haven't had any uh, studies to that, uh, saying that, okay, that, that's going to um, affect the brain function. But logically, if you look at it, so if you are, uh, for example, a, a, a drug addict, um, if you're on a particular drug for a long time, and if you're trying to wean off, there, there's definitely going to be withdrawal. And the, the children might not be able to function uh, well, uh, if you look at it pharmacologically. But uh, the papers and studies, I haven't come across any, so I can't um, say for sure Like what, what is the repercussion of that. Of course, in cancer patients, we don't have that much time to sort of look at what it's going to cause uh, or, or what it does to the mental function of the child in the long term. So I think that's a very good point. I think probably we can look at it, search for literature, and then uh, look at uh, recruiting patients or starting a study. Thank you. Yeah, so. thank you. So one thing which came up in this WHO guideline is that there's so little evidence, so, so much less studied in children. So we have a lot of these things, simple studies, which we should take up and be, be doing it um, to bring out more evidence around yeah, these issues. Thank you, Shubha. Yeah, thank you. With that, uh, Dr. Shubha, would you like to ask your next question? It's about ketamine and uh, your experience, Dr. Gayatri, your experience with uh, ketamine in children. The age of the youngest child have used ketamine and how do you use? Of course, you talked about the study, but would you like to uh, say a little bit more about it? So I have not used ketamine less than two years, but more than two years, we have used ketamine for, of course, procedural pain and also as a burst ketamine and ketamine for palliative sedation, that kind of situations we use. We are talking about chronic pain. No? We are not talking about anesthetic uh, ketamine, of course. So yeah. these are the few indications where I have used ketamine. So do you use it uh, sublingually? Like we used to do that uh, yes. Yes. in the Pain and Palliative Care Society uh, yes. way yes. back in the 90s yes. and beginning of 2000s. Yeah. So uh, the, do the, the dosage that we used to use there, we will be using, using it here as well. Uh, and you we take that I 0.5 was not enough, 0.5 milligram per kg. We okay. found that, especially for procedural point eight, that's the reason if you study, see that study, we, mm -hmm. we did first point five, it was not effective, we increased to point eight. So we tried point eight and point, uh, one milligram. One was they came up with dizziness and side effects, so we restricted to point eight and it worked well in our population. Yeah, yeah so um, we have a 17 year old girl, she's actually admitted in the pediatric. Uh, uh, neurology at the moment and uh, she has CRPS because she fell down from a cycle two years ago and she twisted her left ankle so she's got a swelling there and then um, uh, and she's not even, she's got a foot drop she's not able to move she's been uh, hopping from hospital to hospital for the past two years and people thought that she is imagining the pain then till she developed a foot drop. People thought that she was matching the pain, which was very hurtful. And she's in 11th standard now. Uh, so, and because for the physiotherapy, we were planning to give her ketamine. We just started seeing her the other day and I thought we should get her basic pain medications proper. That's what we're doing at the moment. And then when she goes for physiotherapy, she has severe pain. So I was thinking of giving her ketamine. Of course, 17 years old, you can give. I just wanted to know what is the youngest age you had given? And you said not below two. So that's fine as well. And Absolutely. one thing yeah. yeah, one thing I wanted to ask is, so you use it sublingually or just mix it with uh, uh, orange uh, orange juice or tea or coffee like we used to oh, in the conditions we're talking about. One is for uh, burst ketamine where we use subcure IV. 
Second yeah. is for procedural pain. We give 30 minutes before feed mixed in uh, sweetened juice. And third condition where we use ketamine is uh, breakthrough pain. There we use sublingually, which is um, just uh, uh, keeping it under the tongue. That is a breakthrough pain, which is different right. from procedural pain we are using. Yeah, because I remember there used to be a big long line from the surgical ward in Calicut Medical College for procedural pain. And people used to come and uh, you know get their dressings done. Um, so I had the impression that they had used sublingually at that time. So that's why I asked the question. Breakthrough is that suddenly, suppose we have... Um, Patient suddenly gets pain, there we use sublingual, but mostly otherwise we are very well planned orally, 30 minutes wait, and then do the procedure, that kind of thing. Right, okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in the interest of time, we'll move to the next question. Uh, from the, Dr. Deodar again, are there uh, studies on child's temperament and response to analgesia? I am not sure. Deodar, you, yourself, you, you must have read about it. Uh, do you want to, you want to share something, whatever you have seen? Um, no, no, Gayatri, I haven't actually found. And that is why I asked. And uh, I think there has been, um, but not exactly, because temperament is when the child is really young. So I don't think I uh, found that. So I was just interested. And I'm quite interested in the cross-cultural differences. So that would be something to look at from pediatric palliative care point of view. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that comment. And uh, the next question is uh, from Dr. Gentika. Is it okay to resort right away to sedating the child if after explaining the procedure, the child is still hesitant and combative? Question mark. Uh, she's asking especially uh, for urgent procedures or scenarios. Urgent procedures, generally, we can't do anything like EMLA or, or conscious sedation. We cannot do an urgent procedure. Urgent procedure, then we have to go for IV or very liberal local infiltration of anesthetics because it needs time. If you want, So all procedures, if it, it can be planned, that's the best thing to do where you have this time to plan it well. And um, conscious sedation, we still, we would use it even if the child is explained and child is calm because they say that it leads to um, um, to great amnesia so that they don't remember the unpleasantness of the whole experience. So they are happy to come back for the, not happy, but they're okay to come back for the procedure next time. So even for adults, they say when you do colonoscopy or any such procedures, as anesthetists, like um, we use midazolam for, to take advantage of this action, that the procedure itself, they may not remember bad uh, aspects of it so badly. So that they come back for repeat procedures. Thank you. Um, there are many <coughs> questions, but we will take a couple of them. So uh, again, for sedation, uh, Dr. Chetan asks, for frequent procedures, uh, do you uh, uh, ask for fasting of the patient for sedation? Um, see, again, conscious sedation is different from sedation. I hope uh, we understand the difference. But generally, it's advisable, they say, Six, four, two. Like I said, again, Sushma, you would like to tell me. Uh, six is when we say solids. Four means um, uh, milk and two means clear fluid. Means two, even one to two hours before the procedure, we can give clear fluids to the children before the procedure. Two uh, And four hours before we can give milk. We should not be starving the child. And six hours, we normally talk about other food. Uh, Sushma, any comments uh, on that? Because this is safe, children can vomit anytime, so it has, we have to be safe. So this is the general recommendation for any sedative procedures when we plan, two, four, six. Two means two, one to two hours before we can give clear fluid. Okay, um, uh, we'll wait for Sushma Madam to come back. In the meantime, we can take a question. So when you use morphine in children, what is the laxative of choice that you use? Again, very interesting that not many studies around the use of laxatives. And so people use a lot of lactulose, which is again not really recommended for opioid induced constipation. So the general consensus consensus is about use of stimulant laxatives like Spina or Visacodin. And do you want to use uh, some stool softener along with it? Or softeners we, just we can use, of course. Uh, um, along with stimulant laxatives, like what we use here is uh, cremaffin, which is like um, liquid paraffin with uh, milk of magnesia. 
Right. So I think um, it's quite interesting and uh, more questions coming in, uh, like a role of benzodiazepines for procedural pain. I think you covered that. Yeah, benzodiazepine, mirazolam is a benzodiazepine, it comes under that group. So we use it uh, as a conscious sedation for procedural pain. Yeah, I think Sushma Madam is uh, back online. Minakshi says milk would be breast milk, formula feeds and cow milk would be considered a solid feed. Minakshi, is that a comment or question? I think it's a okay. comment. Yeah, thank you, Meenakshi, for the, uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, so Rajeshri says frequent use of ketamine can lead to a very important side effect we should be all aware of, that cystitis, it can be cause painful cystitis. Yes, uh, thank you, Rajeshri, for bringing that up. And of course, oral ulceration. When you use frequently under the tongue, they, they come back with ulcers, which, which, which um, um, it bothers the patient, yes. So we should be aware of this because if you're not aware, they, if you not look for this problem. So be aware of use of ketamine, cystitis, painful cystitis, and the mouth also. Okay, Shoba says even with burst ketamine, sometimes we see cystitis. So we might, might be aware of that. The so role of oral and sublingual midazolam. Uh, yes, very good question. Babies, irritable babies, in the home setting, we use midazolam buckle. So we don't have to give injection. What we do is very irritable baby with seizures and irritable, generally they're going like that. Simply or buckle midazolam is very useful um, method to calm the baby. So we use it quite frequently uh, for these conditions. So I think Arun, we should stop now. It's already 7 30. <coughs> yeah, we don't have uh, we don't have any more questions. We had a uh, good fifteen minutes for uh, discussion, and it was quite good. Yes, yes, it was a it was a it was an excellent discussion. Lot of questions for Gayatri, and a uh, lot of uh, I think it is because people are a uh, lot of uh, they they want to know more about children because they are they themselves are not practicing so much about uh, this aspect. Uh, so one by one, I will go just quickly in two, in one minute, I will finish that definitely uh, Gayatri in this year, maybe by December, we will have liquid morphine for Indian uh, children. Definitely we will have. Yes, so I am talking to these two people were and Rusan people and I have asked them that they have to make it. But only thing they again, again, again asked me that how much will be the consumption because as the methadone ka flop hua problem, because they have produced methadone and people are not using methadone, so they are almost they are almost in the on the verge of stopping it. So uh, again, uh, I have given them an assurance that we will use methadone as well as liquid morphine, and we should be there. It should be there in the in uh, India. Second thing, uh, which uh, uh, regarding the uh, child uh, fasting, I think uh, fasting is just an uh, this thing, and definitely. Uh, I think minimum two hours uh, for liquid we definitely like to have because people, child can aspirate and uh, then it will be a disaster. Uh, third thing which uh, which about the long term opioids for, uh, I just, it's a comment, uh, nobody has asked me. But uh, uh, I think long term opioids definitely uh, is going to be a challenge for children. But uh, usually this situation never comes that we are using long term opioids uh, in Except in sickle cell patients, uh, otherwise, uh, most of the time when we go for opioids, I think their life expectancy is less than six months or a year maximum. So uh, probably that is the reason we don't find evidence of long-term opioids. Uh, but definitely in sickle cell patient, uh, we can uh, we can have this study because we have seen th three, four sickle cell patients and they were on opioids for years together. So, uh, but they were, basically they were uh, grown up children, uh, I, I think early child, it was not in early childhood. But definitely we will see Gayatri in this area that what is the literature and what should be the, and we will send it to everyone. Thank you. So, thank you very much and uh, see you next uh, Monday before 3, uh, before 6.30 with an, another excellent lecture because now uh, in the, uh, in this month, we have all excellent uh, uh, speakers, those who are stalwarts in area of pediatric palliative care. So next week we will see Dr. Lulu and uh, she will present an another aspect of pediatric palliative care. Uh, so thank you Gayatri and thank you everyone for joining. I know that it is difficult in the morning. 
but still you are there already 70 80 people uh, more than 80 people have joined and thank you arun thank you thank you nipuni from nagaland it gives so much of encouragement that whole india is joining <laughs> thank you very much you also had a participant from um, philippines actually one of my friends yeah <laughs> oh good very good so, so thank you very much and nisha thank you for keeping everybody on track thanks a lot thank you gayatri Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Arun. Bye-bye.